later she passed away. And uh, it was obviously a really hard time on the family. I ended up moving away from my home church, kind of drifted away from the church a little bit. I got a new job. My dad, when I grew up, had uh, a, a bunch of back pain problems, and he uh, was using prescription drugs. He, uh, he, he struggled with uh, dealing with the loss of my sister and uh, ended up switching from prescription drugs to heroin. He lost his job. And um, it, like five or six years later, he ended up uh, losing his life over it. So that was another big struggle. But the, the one thing I keep thinking about is that through that whole process, I feel that God was preparing me by getting me back involved in the church community because I was kind of separated from the church and the body. And I feel that God knew that I was going to need the, the church family and him when my, when my dad passed. From my Bible study group, from the worship band, just everybody, it just surrounded us with love. And I, I never felt God's presence like that moment. And God just, just flooded me with his grace and mercy. story, uh, like the stories that we've been watching throughout this series, um, is, is a difficult one. It's hard um, to watch and you, you feel for him. And yet all of these stories have been the experience and the awareness for them, for these different individuals of God's presence with them. It's been in the midst of, of pain and challenge and sorrow and difficulty. And we've continued to see that, that over and over again. And the reality is, is that God's with us in, in our best moments as well as oftentimes my, my experience is it's oftentimes in the midst of something challenging or really painful that I become aware of it um, and, and discover it and see it. And we're going to continue to talk about that this morning. I want to just real quickly highlight one more, I think, really cool thing that's happened in the, in the church. And sometimes as a pastor, Monday through Friday, there's, there's things happening here all the time that, that we get to see. And I often think to myself, man, I wish everyone was, was watching this right now because it's so cool and there's so much happening in the lives of people. But one story I wanted to tell was we have a Moms Connected ministry um, that some of you may be aware of. It, it meets with moms who have like preteen and teenage kids and just talks about the challenges and joys of, of raising teenagers. And this uh, fall, they had one particular... Um, uh, month where the focus was on serving and engaging, modeling, serving as a parent to your teenage kids. And what does that look like? And so one of the cool ideas, Cheryl Priscillo, who is, runs our local serving department here at Chapel Street, um, created as she so perfectly does, she doesn't just teach on something, she gets you involved in it. And so they, what they did was they created these care packages to go out to our first responders in the community. 320 care packages, all with handwritten notes and gifts um, that were inside, packaged together. And then the moms took the gifts and went out to Elburn and North Aurora and Batavia and Geneva and St. Charles and delivered these to our fire stations and to our police officers and, and, and left these there. And so one of our own Chapel Street church members, Jeff Tarrow, came back to the fire station. He's a fireman and, and looks and he sees these care packages and he just he sees his fellow um, um, co-workers opening these up and just being encouraged by them. He's like, what an amazing idea. Like who had the, uh, the foresight to do this and, and to think of this and opens up his and discovers that it was his own church that had put these together for not only himself, but his friends. And again, he just thought like, you know, he's there and every day trying to model Jesus to his friends and to his coworkers. He thought this is, this is, this is going to make such an impact on these guys. So again, thank you for being a part of sharing the love of Christ during this season. Um, what an incredible thing. What a, just a, a cool opportunity to continue to see that happen. Um, we are now just one week away from Christmas Eve. You getting excited, kids? 
You guys, are you being good? Yeah, Andy's excited. I said kids, Andy. Yeah, it's a, and, and, um, and I'm getting excited. This is an exciting time for me as a dad. I love this time of year, but it's also typically a super busy time of year. Like we try to pack in as, as many Christmas parties and, and family traditions into the next seven days as we possibly can. So there's cookies to bake and there's packages to wrap and there's, there's people that we want to see and, and, and there's people that we want to avoid. And so it's all like, you know, really uh, taxing on us. It, 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 it's a lot. It's a lot. And in addition to kind of the frantic schedule that we have, we have a we have a tendency, if you're anything like me, to build in a lot of expectation to this time of year. Um, it, it gets a little overwhelming. We build these, these mental pictures of the joy on my kid's face when they open up the perfect gift that I've worked so hard for them to get. You know? Or, or, or we have this mental sort of imagery that we conjure up of everyone we love gathered around singing Christmas carols and in perfect harmony and we're all holding like a steaming hot cup of hot chocolate, right? And, and it's all so magical. It's all so perfect. But oftentimes, the, the mental sort of idea that we create for ourselves and the reality of the experience don't match up perfectly. And when it doesn't match up perfectly, at, at best case, we kind of become discouraged or disappointed. Um, but more often, it kind of leads to, to conflict and, and people kind of being at each other, right? Uh, one such example, uh, one of the traditions my family and I had for years was we would go out to Elburn to the Larsons. Has anybody out, been out to the Larsons? They have their home decorated, head to toe, their whole property set to lights, like tens of thousands of lights. I have no idea how many. And then, and, and then it's all set to music. So the lights are dancing to the music and they're playing Christmas uh, carols and it's just a beautiful thing. And, and tons and tons of people drive out there to see it and sit in their lawn and do all this sort of stuff. And, um, and, and so we stopped getting Starbucks, loaded up on the hot chocolate and we're sitting in the car and I'm picturing like, this is a nice family moment, right? Like you can just be together and watch all this. And it's like, as a dad, you're just smiling like ear to ear. And, and then the music starts to play and the kids are watching the lights and there began to be a little bit of a disagreement about whether or not it was appropriate or appreciated to sing along with the music. One daughter felt very strongly that we should sing along with the music. A different daughter, both of whom will remain nameless to protect the guilty, felt very strongly that they just wanted to hear the music itself. And I'm sitting there watching, trying to just take in the show, but listening to the fight. And my wife is recording all of this on, on her phone. This is when we had started together at Christmas and everybody was posting like these sweet family like pictures and like hashtag together at Christmas. And like the, the thing is going, my kids are fighting all of a sudden I turn around and I'm like, listen, everyone just shut up and watch the Christmas lights. We're going to enjoy the show. You're going to feel the joy of Christmas, you know, like, and then my wife turns to me with her phone. And it's like, together at Christmas, like it's <laughs> perfect family moment, right? And you've been there, you've had these. I'm not the only one, I hope. <laughs> we, we have been talking about over the last four weeks, we've been looking in our series entitled With, what does it mean to experience the presence of Emmanuel, God with us? What is the ramification of, of the God who came to be with us and specifically this morning, I want us to think about the significance of the meaning of, of the peace of Emmanuel. What does it mean to experience the peace of Emmanuel? I want to begin by looking at a passage that is often read from the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 9, where Isaiah is, is projecting, looking forward to the arrival of, of Emmanuel. And he, God is, is giving him this understanding of who Jesus will be, and he begins to give this description of, of who the Savior would be. This is Isaiah chapter 9. I'm going to start in verse 2, and then I'm going to read verse 6 and 7 as well. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. For to us a child is born. To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, 
mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of His government of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over His kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So here in Isaiah's account of of who the Savior will be, who Messiah will be, he is described, the arrival of Emmanuel is described as the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. In addition to, to Isaiah's picture that he gives us here, Luke 2 records the proclamation of the angels in the moment, the arrival, and it says, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom He is pleased. So the question that I'm wrestling with and that I want us to think about to seek to understand today is what does it mean for Jesus to be the Prince of Peace? Or in other words, how can Jesus be the Prince of Peace when there is so much violence and conflict and turmoil in the world around us because there's a there's a bit of a disconnect here for us we don't look at the world around us and and get this overwhelming sense of peace even when in our own personal lives things are relatively ordered or or the people around us are getting along we can we can look at what's taking place on the greater landscape and become discouraged and and disheartened so how do we reconcile the one the arrival of the one who is the prince of peace with the reality that is anything but peaceful and that's what we want to attempt to to work through together today and i want to begin by talking about the nature of peace the nature of peace uh, kids, you will not relate to this, but parents, you will. Um, you know that moment when your kids have opened up all their gifts and there's that one gift that they just want to start playing with, right? And they're like, dad, 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 can we set this up? And, and so you start to unpackage the thing. For some reason, they've chosen to package children's toys as like, um, it's basically like breaking into Fort Knox. Like it's, they, they've, they've, like my kids, I have all girls. And so my kids, it's always like these dolls and things. And there's tiny shoes that are basically encased in like a, a cube of plastic concrete. Like, and it takes hours to get it out and you, you get it set up and, 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 and then there's a piece missing, right? Like the one piece that makes the whole thing function. Like somehow, like, where did it go? Like I've dumped out like the recycling bin looking for the one piece that's going to make the toy that my child wants to play with so badly work. Like, you know that moment? Like, it doesn't bring out Christmas joy in your parents. So kids, just be nice to us when that's happening uh, here next week, okay? No promises. (laughs) I appreciate that. I appreciate the honesty. You see, as we look, as we begin to enter into this discussion, We have to think about what does it mean when we talk about peace? Because for most of us, when we're talking about peace, what it means to be peaceful, we we think about things like peace of mind, right? That that calm that we get when everything is okay. So as a parent of teenagers, when when everybody's back under my roof and everybody's safely in bed, I I have peace of mind. I took my oldest daughter to get her driving permit yesterday. I may never have peace of mind again. Like it's... <laughs> or we talk about things like inner peace, meaning that idea that, that there's quietness or tranquility of the soul. This is, this is sort of like the Serenity Now episode of, of Seinfeld. This is the promise of sort of Eastern philosophies that, that if we meditate enough, we'll we'll have this sort of spiritual, harmonious life devoid of stress and anxiety. Or perhaps we just we simply mean the absence of conflict. That the people around us are getting along, or at least they're pretending to get along, so we have peace. And like this is a big one for me. Like I, I hate relational conflict and stress. I, I hate when I feel like that there's some sort of relational um, conflict in my life, usually because I've done or said something stupid right? Like that stuff eats me up inside. So is the absence of that, what it means, is that what we're talking about when we talk about the peace of Emmanuel? 
Is that all it is to live in and to live with the peace of Emmanuel? Because what strikes me about all these ideas of peace is just how fragile they are. How easily disrupted that peace is when conflict does enter the picture. Or, or when our inner calm is disrupted. It leaves us looking for something greater, for something lasting. And this brings us to the arrival of Jesus. Let's turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. We're going to look at a, an interaction with a man named Simeon as he encounters Jesus. This is verse 25 and following. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came into an and he came in the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now, let, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation that you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people, Israel. And his father and his mother marveled at what was said about him. See, we don't know a lot about Simeon, um, really other than, than what we're told here in these few verses. But what we do gain here is an understanding of how he saw Jesus and the implication of his arrival. Simeon is... is in Jerusalem, it says that he is waiting for the consolation of Israel. He's waiting for God to provide Israel with their rescuer, with, with their comforter. He waits for the one who had come to restore peace that they have waited for for generations. God allows him to meet the, the Prince of Peace. The one who would accomplish the very thing that he desired more than anything else. As he says, my eyes have seen your salvation. See, this is, this is Simeon's understanding of peace. That phrase that he says that you are letting me depart in peace because he understands that God is providing for salvation. Earlier in Luke chapter 1, Zechariah, when he's talking about his son, John the Baptist, says this. He says, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways to give knowledge of salvation to His people and the forgiveness of their sins. See, this is, this is the peace that Jesus came to usher in. This is what Messiah, what Emmanuel, what Jesus had come to do. This is the missing peace that enables everything to fit together, to function according to its design. It's Jesus. Through His birth and ultimately through His sacrifice, He would offer forgiveness and it is Forgiveness that enables us once again to be at peace with the God who created us. To be restored back into the relationship that we were designed for from the very beginning. Paul, in his letter to, to the Romans in Romans chapter 5, he says it this way. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into His grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So, so Paul's point, if we can think of it this way, is that the legal status or our standing before God, for those of us that have been put up, placed our faith in Jesus, has changed. We've gone from being guilty on, on all charges to being declared innocent. To, as ones who have been justified, who've been made right, with God. We no longer, and here's the good news, we no longer live in fear because of a broken relationship. But as Paul says, but, but we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is ultimately the peace that He makes available to us. It isn't dependent on my ability to get it, and it isn't dependent on me to maintain it. He's done it for us. And here's the thing. Until we discover peace with Him, 
we will always search for some sort of inferior version of what he's already accomplished. We'll always try to find it somewhere else. So this nature of peace then gives way to and informs how we experience peace. The experience of peace. My oldest daughter is uh, taking geometry, and so she's uh, achieved a level of math that I am no longer capable of helping her out with. And that was actually like fourth grade, but, but this is definitely the case. But she sometimes with, in, in this class, will get like these logic problems that, that she has to do where you're given certain information and you have to arrive at different information, and the information you have really doesn't tell you the answer but it ultimately allows you to solve along the way in order to obtain new information to arrive at the answer. The, 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 the fundamental truth that you start with shapes ultimately where you end up and what you need in that moment. See, this is, this is what the peace of, of God does for us, the peace of Emmanuel and how we experience it. The fundamental truth of His peace that we've been restored to a relationship with God now affects and impacts, it has ramifications in every area of our life. Jesus made this clear in, in the Gospel of John. This is in John chapter 14, verse 27. He said this to His disciples. He says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Further on in chapter 16, he says it this way. He says, I have said these things to you that are in, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Like Jesus is telling us two really important things here. One, he affirms what we see at, at the initial entry in Advent in, in Luke chapter 1 and 2 is that He has come to bring peace. He states that over and over again. That's the fundamental truth that we begin with. But He also teaches us and reiterates that this does not mean that the experience of peace does not mean the absence of conflict or difficulty or pain or that things won't be hard. And this is for me where I can get a little sidetracked from time to time. Because I can build an expectation like I do at Christmas, right? I build an expectation that, that the experience of peace means the absence of pain. As a result, when pain and disappointment are present in my life, I become frustrated or disillusioned and, and feel like Jesus somehow isn't coming through for me. That I'm, that I'm not experiencing His promised peace. But this is never what Jesus taught us. This is never what He demonstrated to us. In fact, He specifically said, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I can't hear those words and not think of Pastor Roger, who many of you maybe don't know. Pastor Roger passed away a few years ago after a long, long battle of, with cancer. And, and matter of fact, the whole time I knew him, he was battling cancer. Um, but Pastor Roger, when we would celebrate Holy Week communion during Easter, if you were to take communion um, at his table, he would always pronounce in this booming voice of his these exact words. And I always thought how appropriate for him because he lived this perhaps more than anyone I ever knew. He used to tell people all the time who would ask him how his treatments were going or how he was getting along. And we would gather around him and sometimes pray for healing and people would want to know and update and and he would say, oh, I've been healed. I've been healed. I may get well, I may not, but I've been healed. Like he understood, he lived out peace in the midst of circumstances that were incredibly painful and difficult. And this is the experience of peace. Not the absence of pain, but rather the certainty of what Jesus has already done for me. You see, this is, this is his peace, his reconciling work that has placed us back into a right relationship with God. And this is the overarching truth that overshadows all of our circumstances. No matter what's going on in our lives. Not that it's easy, not that it's comfortable, not that we like it. But this thing doesn't change. That He's changed us. That He's brought us in to His salvation. So will we experience difficult things? Will we be in grief and pain and disappointment? We absolutely will. But it does not change this one thing. I have been made right with God. I've been restored into a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We have peace 
The peace that we have is more than a circumstantial feeling. It is a secured future. This is why Paul, when he's writing a letter to to the Philippians in Philippians chapter 4, he says there's a peace. He talks about a peace that surpasses understanding. Paul's writing that from a prison cell in, in Rome where he's likely waiting his eventual execution. But he knows that his future is secured, and that's peace. And ultimately, then, this leads us to, to the pursuit of peace. The pursuit of peace. I, my grandfather, in his retirement, um, he never really retired. He was sort of one of those guys. And he's 92 now, and so now he's pretty retired. But um, <laughs> he, he had one of the door-to-door salesmen stop by and, and um, show him a rainbow vacuum. Um, and my grandpa bought a rainbow vacuum. But not only did he buy a rainbow, rainbow vacuum, he also became a salesman for rainbow vacuums. And I thought, that's a powerful vacuum. Like, <laughs> that, that you can be so impressed with it that you'd spend all that money to get the vacuum, but that, that you also feel like you need to make people aware of, of the opportunity to own a rainbow vacuum. Like this is, this is what the experience of peace does in our life, particularly in the moments when life isn't going that well, is that it allows us and it enables us to show the uniqueness of Jesus, of what He's done as, as our Savior, as our Messiah to the world around us. This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. It says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart to which indeed you were called in one body. This is is the call. For those of us, if you're here this morning and you've experienced the peace that is available through Jesus because you've been reconciled back to God and you know that your sins are forgiven, this this is our call. To pursue that peace, to allow the world to experience that peace around us. Because we've established already that our world lives in turmoil and conflict. This is their everyday experience. It is the presence of peace, the awareness of a secured future that that will reveal the hope that we have in Jesus. It's certainty in the midst of of uncertainty that points them back to that one foundational, that one fundamental truth that is our peace. That we have been made right with God through faith in Jesus. Jesus. I'm not talking about pretending to be happy. That would be disingenuous. Nobody wants somebody that's fake. I'm talking about living in light of what Jesus has done for us in our best moments and in the most painful, most difficult, trying moments of our lives. See, this is, this is peace. This is the peace of Emmanuel. This is the peace that we experience of a God who came to be with us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank You for this day and we thank You for this opportunity once again to look in Your Word. We thank You again for the opportunity to consider what it is that You accomplished as You came here to be with us. And I pray today that we would once again live in the light of the peace that is available, knowing that that doesn't mean life will be easy, but it means that we have been restored back to a relationship with You. Lord, I pray that the world would see that in us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All for this morning's benediction. We're one of two people. We're people who have experienced that peace, who've known that in Jesus, or we're people searching for that peace. My prayer is if you're one searching for that peace, that you would find it. Even today, in Jesus, we'd love to tell you, talk to you about what a relationship with Him means and how you can experience that. And if you're one who's experienced that, my prayer is that you would live in it. In our best moments and in our worst. Now receive this morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Prince of Peace who has secured our future for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Great job, kids, today. You guys were awesome. Thank you. And we'll see you back next week.